Today we're here to talk to you about supply chain and uh, its relationship and the dynamics of it and the challenges. And Canada's supply chain is, is consistently under pressure. International competition, availability of resources, labor disruption, infrastructure needs and investments, climate impact, regulatory impacts, and, and the desire and need to evolve our supply chain um, with a strong focus on sustain sustainability. We are not just about trucks and trains. It's more complicated and more integrated than that. And today we'll hopefully um, get to a point where we can create a little bit more awareness around the challenges, but also the opportunities that exist within the supply chain as it relates to agriculture. The format for today's panel, a little bit different than some panels, we're going to have a keynote speech from our deputy minister. And then each of the panelists will have some comments of their own relevant to the supply chain environment. And then I will do my very best to try to challenge them with some questions. Unfortunately, because of the format today, I don't think we'll have time for Q&A from the audience, but uh, I'll try to do my very best with regards to um, answering the questions that hopefully are on your minds. So let me first introduce you to our panel. First up is Ron Lemaire. He's the president of the Canadian Produce Marketing Association. In his role, Ron, as the CPMA president, represents the needs and interests of 830 Canadian and international member companies who are responsible for over 90% of the fresh fruit and vegetable sales here in Canada. Mark Brazo is the president and CEO of the Railway Association of Canada representing more than 50 freight, passenger, freight and passenger railway companies and has over 30 years of experience that he brings to his role at RAC. And Jean Catuso is the past president and CEO of Lassonde Industries. Jean uh, joined Lassonde in 1987 and quickly moved through the ranks and in 2012 was named the CEO uh, of the organization. Jean also co-chaired the uh, federal government's uh, industry supply chain task force and was for 20 odd years, a member of the board of directors of Food, Health and Consumer Products of Canada as well. And finally, our keynote speaker, Arun Thangaraj. Arun was appointed deputy minister of transportation on February 20th, uh, 2023. Arun has a significant government experience servicing appointments in Immigration and Refugee and Citizenship Canada, Global Affairs Canada, Canadian International Development Agency, and the Canadian Transport Agency. He received the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal for his contribution to the federal public service and his communities in 2013. He's also a chartered professional accountant, holds a Master's of Arts in the Public Administration, has his MBA, and an honor MBA in political science, and is, I find, though all of, or most of his academic time was spent here in Ottawa, he had that one little stint in Toronto for one of his degrees and came back to Ottawa, a Toronto Maple Leaf hockey fan. So <laughs> with that, I will uh, turn the podium over to Arun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. For the record, I'm a, I'm a Torontonian by birth and uh, <laughs> And a Leaf fan by misfortune, by, I'm not sure, uh, but uh, as I say this year, uh, like every other year, this might be the year. <laughs> Probably not. Um, but thank you very much, Michael, for that kind introduction. Thank you all for uh, inviting me here today. Um, and before I begin, I do want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the traditional and unceded territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin people. And I'm very proud uh, to be a guest on this land and to be the place where I live and I work and I play. Supply chains are an interesting topic, right? I don't think prior to 2020, the notion of supply chains resonated with anybody. Right? We knew what they were, they were taught in operations management, Classes. I imagine if you were at the Asper School uh, of Business in, in Winnipeg, you would have been very much seized with logistics and supply chains. But for the average Canadian, it wasn't top of mind. 
but it has been top of mind for policymakers. We do know that what Canada grows and produces is what the world needs. And the gap from getting to what we produce and to meeting global demand is a supply chain. In that, 22, in, that, in that period between 2020 and probably 2023, 24, we were all made familiar with the unprecedented and unrelenting pressures on our supply chains. And it, there was a number of causes, whether that be um, the global pandemic, wildfires, atmospheric rivers, and international conflict. And if we look at the data today, the supply chains are more fluid. But we can say, and that's all we can say is that they're more fluid. But the pressures that created those, the pressures that were created by those circumstances still exist. And the pinch points still exist. And so therefore, it is imperative that we tackle them now. I think the other thing about Canadian supply chains that is very unique when I talk to our colleagues in the United States, for example, uh, where your last speaker was from, but also globally, is that we face very different conditions and circumstances than does anywhere else in Canada. If I look at the weather tomorrow, the low is going to be minus 13 and the high is going to be plus 13. And there are very few places in the world where you have 25 degree or 26 degree swings in a day, let alone uh, over a season. Our winters are harsh and unrelenting. Our geography is difficult. The distances that we need to travel to get goods to market and to maintain affordability is a challenge that is unique to the Canadian supply chain and logistics system. We know that it's becoming more costly and taking longer to expand and to build new infrastructure, even as certain parts of that infrastructure system are underutilized. We know that the scale and frequency of disruptions puts pressure on our need to be more resilient. What I can say to you is that we have recognized from a policy perspective at the Department of Transportation and with the federal government that now is the time to act to address the supply chain challenges that we collectively face. And there already have been certain improvements. And as a bureaucrat, we think that bureaucracies are this answer and solution to all of life's problems. And that's not necessarily the case, but I do want to start by saying that one of the things that we are doing is bureaucratic. We do know that, and this was pointed out in Jean's report, is that there was no central point in the federal government to address supply chain challenges. You could go to Agriculture Canada, you can go to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, you can come to Transport Canada, Global Affairs, and probably CBSA, a number of other departments. And there was a need for a coordinated, unifying um, group to, to do this. And part of what the Supply Chain Task Force did among all of their, their recommendations, and there were 21, is to say government needs to get its act together and be focused in how we deal with the supply chain. And so last December, an office that's specifically dedicated to looking at supply chains, the infrastructure that unpins them, underpins them, the regulatory environment within which we work uh, is looked at from an outside-in perspective. Often when we look at things, we're, you know, we sit in Ottawa and we look at things, and even if we're regionally based, we understand things from an inside-out perspective. And what the recommendation of, of the task force was is be externally focused. Understand the competitive dynamics and the operating realities of the industry to ensure that you fully understand the challenges therein. And so one of the first steps of the supply chain was to bring government and industry together to understand, one, what are the questions that we need to ask? Where are the gaps? Where are our priorities? And what are the things that we don't no, and maybe not to the surprise to many of you in this room, government, government does not know everything about supply chains. It's those who use them and on, on a daily basis and understand the intricacies and interdependencies who are best placed to give us advice on how those supply chain offices work. And so one of the first tasks was to meet with stakeholders across the country to look at what are the concrete steps that we can make 
to improve the system performance. And one of those tools is the use of data and digital technology. And far be it for me to say um, that digital is the, the solution to all of life's problems. But what digital does is two things. One, it tells us how the system is performing. In, during the height of the pandemic and during some of those crises, we try to determine through experience, through interaction, how well the supply chain works. Well, we had a partial answer. And we do know from experiences uh, with partners in the United States and others is that supply chain visibility is a key tool to improving fluidity, knowing where things are, knowing where the pinch points are, knowing what is shipped when, and understanding how best to optimize those things is, is what's required. And it's not government optimizing. Let me say that for the record. It's providing a common set of framework and digital and, and data while being mindful and protecting consumer confidentiality, but providing information and a common set of information that decisions can be made. For government, it also helps inform decisions about where infrastructure is needed, how, where the pinch points are and where investments, and we all know money is scarce. And so when we make investments, we have to make sure that they're leveraged to the maximum benefit. And what we're looking for is an evidentiary basis for that to happen. The last action that the supply chain office will do is develop a long-term national supply chain strategy to make sure that our initiatives in this area are, are evidence-based and focused. And the focus of that strategy is to make sure that fluidity, efficiency, resilience, and reliability, as well as sustainability, are core elements of that supply chain. And that last piece, sustainability, is important. Um, we do know, and it's a shared perspective, that a sustainable system is a system that protects our ecosystems and protects our people. And we know that the, the world's major economies are moving quickly to build net zero supply chains and transform their economies. And Canada must keep pace and not be left behind. The reality is industry is doing this. The railway industry is, is working with hydrogen locomotives. We're, we're doing better at, at decarbonizing marine shipping and other modes. And, and the move to a cleaner, more sustainable transportation system provides an opportunity for this country and at the same time benefit supply chains. We do know, as, as was mentioned, I'm an accountant. Don't hold that against me. But the accounting convention is looking at how do we capture scope two and scope three emissions? And how do we declare them? And so it is a competitive imper imperative for this country to make sure that our supply chains don't forget the issue of sustainability and indirect emissions of things that we don't necessarily control when goods are transported to market. On the marine side, one of the things that we're doing very clearly and, and was announced in the last budget was launching a green shipping corridors program. And that's a program that's gonna invest $165 million over the next seven years to help create zero emission maritime routes in both, both of our coasts and along the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Seaway. And what we're looking at doing is incentivizing uh, and providing funding for innovative ship technology, port facilities, and procedures to achieve those goals. And we have also recently funded research and development encouraging innovation and in clean tech in the transportation se sector that uses wind or solar to help air reduce air pollution and greenhouse gases involved in the various modes of, of transport. One of our key focuses is the issue of hydrogen and how we can use hydrogen fuel cells, biodiesel, low carbon renewable fuels, and other sources of power from trains to cruise ships. And there's other projects that are underway to look at how do we uh, reduce uh, the impact of aviation through the use of sustainable aviation fuels. I think one of the realities, as we said, is Canada's a large country. And we do know that many agricultural products that are produced get to their uh, destination, the intermediate or final, by truck. And so Canada has committed to ensuring that 100% of medium and heavy duty vehicles are zero emission by 2040. And to deliver on this, 
we're providing purchase in incentives to help Canadian businesses and organizations to purchase or lease these vehicles to help decarbonize the supply chain and to meet the global pressure in this area. Our challenges, whether it be extreme weather, rising costs, affordability, global tensions, and the increasing need for a dependable supply chain as an exporter are also opportunities for us to learn. And that learning is not going to take place with just the federal government. It is going to rely on us working with provinces and territories and municipalities and industry and producers to make sure that our supply chains are fluid, efficient, reliable, and sustainable, both in the short term and to meet the challenges of today and tomorrow. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Arun. There we go. There we go. Um, let me turn it over to Mark. All right, I've got five minutes. You have what you need. <laughs> All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, great to be here. Uh, thank you to, uh, to Keith and uh, Scott and, and Lori for the invitation and to be part of this panel. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, for us, um, you know, railways uh, are uh, reliable partners to the Canadian agricultural community. and. Not only are we partners, but we're enthusiastic supporters of your sector. And, um, and I think the success of our railways uh, is always directly linked to the success of producers, uh, grain companies, and other ag supporting organizations. So we're, we really are intertwined in terms of our ability to succeed and, and get products to world markets. Um, we believe that Canadian Railways are providing uh, and delivering uh, for Canadian farmers and the entire ag uh, value chain. Uh, you know, we have one of the highest uh, safety records in North America, uh, and our strong service is in line with uh, customer demand. And uh, as Arun alluded to, uh, we do this in some of the harshest uh, operating environments uh, that you'll find anywhere on earth, and uh, we do it at uh, virtually the lowest cost in the world. Uh, we recently did a study, it came out last year, some of you may have read it, the CPCS study, an independent third-party study which looked at uh, freight rates uh, Canadian freight rates in comparison to other freight rates uh, uh, across the world. Uh, we are 11% 11, 11 lower than the U.S. and uh, significantly lower than other comparable jurisdictions. Uh, average freight rates for related uh, grain uh, for, or for regulated grain are another 29% uh, below uh, globally uh, global averages. So the evidence is clear. Uh, railways are reliable partners for the ag industry and we're able to do that at uh, world-class rates. Uh, Transit times, and again, you know, Arun alluded to the challenges that we face since 2020. Uh, you know, total transit time uh, during the pandemic years uh, was a challenge. Uh, however, for uh, in 2022, for Saskatchewan grain to reach uh, Asian markets, it was one day shorter in 2019, uh, despite some of those challenges. So, again, you know, I think the railways demonstrated tremendous resiliency, and and were able to uh, you know to do their job in order to get. Uh, uh, products and, and, uh, and, and our goods to uh, world markets. Um, port dwell times, however, uh, you know, they did increase. In fact, they, they, they nearly doubled during the pandemic to 158 hours in 2022, uh, while the average railway terminal uh, dwells remain historically consistent at, a, at below eight hours. However, you know, again, and this is not to point the finger at anyone within the supply chain because we are fully integrated and we got to work together. And, uh, and, and that's something that I think, again, uh, with the work uh, that's been done uh, by the supply chain office, uh, there's opportunities there to continue to make sure that we all work together. Um, railways are investing uh, to move more uh, Canadian ag and other products safely, reliably, and efficiently. Uh, on average, uh, railways invest between 20 and 25 percent of annual revenues, uh, which is a staggering number compared to, uh, to other sectors. So, so again, I think the the reality is that there is a commitment uh, year over year by the railways to make sure that they, they are reinvesting. And I think, you know, what we saw in the 2022-2023 crop years, uh, you know, record, record amount of grain was moved, and uh, that just didn't happen by chance. It, it takes coordinated planning and investment. And again, I think uh, what we saw from our two class ones, CN and CPKC, uh, was targeted investments. And I'll take the example of the high-capacity grain hopper cars. Uh, you know, uh, 
that was uh, over $1 billion uh, invested by both class ones in securing uh, high capacity green hopper cars built, by the way, in Canada uh, by National Steel Car in Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, so over the past decade, railways have invested over $21.5 billion back into their network. Uh, and other supply chains have made important investments as well. And, uh, and I think, you know, it goes without saying that investments made by the terminals uh, to ensure that they had high throughput uh, by the grain companies, uh, that was a targeted investment and it made a difference along with the grain hopper cars. So, you know, one of the things that uh, we always do, like every other industry, we, we compete for private capital. Uh, so the railways, like other industries, look for reasonable returns on their investment. Uh, because without a return, a company's ability to maintain and upgrade its assets uh, is constrained and eventually uh, service and resiliency does suffer. Uh, so the one thing, you know, that uh, we work closely with the federal government on uh, and Arun and his team is to make sure that, uh, you know, good sound policy, uh, to, you know, s support programs are in place. And, you know, there's no secret that we were not happy with the, uh, with the decision made uh, to, with extended dinner switching. Uh, you know, that, that was a policy that uh, continues to have an impact on the railway's uh, ability to retain the business in Canada. And frankly, what we saw in 2014 to 2017 uh, was uh, more traffic moving south. And when you have more traffic moving south, then that means there's more jobs uh, heading south. Uh, because uh, those containers and those goods are headed to U.S. ports. So uh, we think that uh, extended inner switching, uh, the pilot project uh, should be repealed. And, uh, and uh, you know, we want to make sure that, again, uh, rail car movements happen within this country and that we're able to uh, continue to reinvest back in our network. Um, railways operate in an interconnected network, and that means that, uh, you know, uh, when things aren't working or when... Uh, we're not able to create that right investment climate uh, that everybody, that all shippers are harmed by that uh, inefficiency. So again, uh, making sure that we are uh, having, uh, you know, government policy focused on tangible actions uh, to strengthen the supply chains. And one example of that, a concrete example, is the lack of grain loading vessels onto the rain at the Port of Vancouver. I think that's an issue that uh, many of you may be familiar with. Uh, there are safe solutions uh, to, uh, to resolve uh, this problem. In fact, there are competing ports in Seattle and Portland uh, that are loading grain in the rain and have been for some time and are doing it safely. So uh, the Port of Vancouver has estimated that solving uh, that problem, so being able to load grain in the rain, uh, would unlock about 7% in new capacity, and that's significant when you think about it. Uh, so railways are making the investments uh, needed to bring more Canadian egg products uh, to global markets, and uh, we're hoping that uh, supply chain partners like Terminals and at the Port of Vancouver uh, that they're able to make those kinds of investment as well. And I think, again, government has a role to play in helping encourage this type of investment. You know, whether it be accelerated depreciation measures for all supply chain partners, uh, that would be one good example where I, I think we would all benefit from that. So, you know, just a final points, we should mac maximize port capacity with 24-7 uh, terminal operations to match the 24-7, 365 uh, service that you get from the railways. Uh, we think all supply chain partners have a role to play in growing that capacity in order to meet that demand and increase efficiency. Uh, if rail cars do not arrive on time at an in-country uh, elevator because it was raining in Vancouver, pretty tough to blame the railways if we don't have some of those solutions in place. Uh, so again, I think uh, Arun touched on it. We would like to see more operational data sharing, uh, support for short-line railways, including uh, a proven tax credit model that exists in the U.S., and continued targeting investments via the National Trade Corridor Fund. And, and I tip my hat to Arun and, and the government for continuing to uh, provide the support that's needed there to make sure that we have efficiency in our supply chain through that uh, Trade Corridor Fund. So final note, it is investments that move supply chains and helps Canada feed the world. And uh, we'd like to see more investments and less uh, prescriptive regulations. So thank, you, thank you. Thank you, Mark, very much. Jean? Thank you, Michael. Bonjour, good day. It's a pleasure to be here at this uh, annual general meeting. In 2022, I had the opportunity to co-chair with Louise Yako the National Supply Chain Task Force. Notre rapport s'appelait le Hack Report. Action, collaboration, transformation. Through the process, we mobilized 160 organizations. We received 70 written 
presentation, and we spent a full week in Washington because actually the United States are our biggest trading partner, and our supply chain network is so interconnected. As a supply chain task force member and co-chair, we submit a report with 21 recommendations. 10 recommendations to unclog the system, and three recommendations on governance, the supply chain office, supply chain strategy, the labor strategy, and eight long-term recommendations. We're pleased to hear also that now we have a supply chain office, we're moving, pleased that the government have been taking a lot of our recommendation. We have to look at Canada, and that was also the example we was using when we tour Canada, being a big plant or a network of plant in which we are working. Unfortunately, however, we're working in silos. So the MRP system of Canada is still not fixed, okay? I would joke and say sales are not talking to, to production or not to inventory or purchasing. Therefore, we are not giving good service. On a besoin de satisfaire et de donner un bon service à nos clients internes et externes. Because Canada is a world trader. 61% of Canada's GDP depend on trade, $1.24 trillion. In 2021, the United States, Canada top trading partner, account for $774 billion of business, $470 in export, $298 in import. So 62% of all Canadian trade. There are five major areas of, of trade in Canada. Energy, agri-food fertilizer, natural resources with critical mineral, industrial inputs, and essential medical service. Donc, l'agroalimentaire, les fertilisants sont dans le groupe des cinq plus importants secteurs. In 2020, road transport account for 50% of Canada merchandise trade, import-export combined, 23% by water, 15% by air, and 12% by rail. Si on veut améliorer la vie des Canadiens, on doit augmenter l'enrichissement de ce pays. This enrichment will only come on efficient, competitive, and reliable supply chain. As you may know, I spent 34 years in my career at Lausanne Industry, a food publicly traded company, and 12 years as president of the group, and 23 years as president of one of the main subsidiaries. So when Lausanne was doing 80 million of sales, we could not afford for our employees daycare, gym, guess what? At $2 billion of sale and being a North American company, we could offer to our employees better life, better working condition. Supply chain is all about competitive, efficient, and reliable. Not being reliable is what's probably the worst sin. Who wants to be do business with somebody which is not a reliable supplier? Canada needs to have bullish objective in terms of reliability. 80% of the world can, ocean freight is controlled by eight companies. They can bring their container whatever best reliable ports. Is Canada a reliable partner? No, we still have a lot of work to do. We're not reliable partner, as in, and I'll use an example. You're a world maritime company. You bring your boat on the St. Lawrence River hey, and heading for Montreal port. After a 10-day trip, you get a notice that the port will be on strike in the next 20, 72 hours. If you are a maritime company, do you think Canada is a reliable partner? Better off you unload your container in the U.S. port. Let's not underestimate that possibility. We need to re a regulation and laws that make Canada a reliable partner. And it's a good thing that the supply chain office right now is looking also at, at these, at these issues. Government, transportation, and logistic provider Shipper, producer, manufacturer, and retailer must act decisively and urgently to create a supply chain system that is more agile, flexible, resilient, and efficient. The actual slowdown in the Canadian economy in 2022 gave the, 23, gave the country better freight rate and more shipping capacity. We have a relief. Oof. Therefore, we need to accelerate our action, collaboration, collaborate faster in transformation and transform, it, transform our supply chain. Canada trading partners, trading opportunity has never been so great. The world needs our patas, our grain, our agri-food product, but we need to be better to get the good to our customer. 
As we continue our trade volume, we need to increase our investment in critical infrastructure assets, such as seaport, dry port, highway roads, airport, built infrastructure. But furthermore, we need to digitalize and create an end-to-end -end supply chain visibility for efficiency, accountability, planning, investment, and security. Our Maple 8, who's are our Maple 8? Our Maple 8 pension plan, such as BCI, OTPP, PSP, CASE, who are managing over $2 trillion of assets with the money of Canadian workers, need to act in also in the Canadian infrastructure. For every dollar managed by the eight, the eight largest pension fund in Canada, only 75 cents is invested outside of Canada. Of the 25 cents invested in Canada, two cents is invested in infrastructure. What type of future Canada want? Le Canada, avec une population de 40 millions de, de personnes, a besoin d'investir ici, si on veut être plus performant. Dans notre rapport, as you saw, nous avons, avec l'aide de, de, de Deloitte, identifié des investissements de 4 400 milliards pour les 50 prochaines années dans nos infrastructures, basées sur une croissance de la population de 0,7 puis un GDP qui augmentait d'à peu près 2 par année. Je veux dire, on, on, ça ne sera même pas assez, 4 400 milliards, 4,4 trillion. So Canada, with a competitive and efficient and reliable supply chain, will be capable to improve the condition, the life of Canadians. We need to act faster in this competitive and very changing world. Speed is so strategic. The question is that we can produce more, but we need to get the goods to our customer competitively, efficiently, and reliably. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Ron? Let's just make sure that's on. Great. Well, the nice thing about being uh, the last in the panel is that uh, my colleagues have really touched on a lot of the key issues. I'm not going to repeat them, but I want to take this from a, a fresh fruit and vegetable perspective. In a world where you sell it or smell it, and many in the room here working in ag, working in food, will realize how important supply chains are and what we need to do to push product from the farm to the consumer. And at the end of the day, with everything our, my colleagues have talked to, if there is a disruption, the one group that pays the most dearest is the farmer. Everything goes back to the beginning. And the impact on the farmer is felt the highest. So how do we deal with that? And how do we drive forward? One of my board members clearly framed out in a supply chain framework. Supply chains are like an orchestra. All the instruments have to be tuned and making and be clear when they play together. And they have to play together. One instrument that's not tuned correctly, you can hear it and it breaks the orchestra down. So how do we take everything that we need to move forward with the orchestra and our supply chain and ensure that we don't see one of the links break and have a continuous disruption through the entire system? And this goes back to a biggest piece of the puzzle. I haven't heard anyone say it. Food is essential. We're missing that key component in all of our policy and regulation in Canada. How are we actually working through supply chains when I see potatoes sitting in the Montreal port hidden behind containers, destined for the market, and they can't get out? They can't even be identified. Back to the point of predictive analytics, data. How do you actually move product through the system? How do you ensure that we are a reliable country for trade where shippers that are sending citrus to Canada, products we don't grow, and again, they sit at port they aren't identified clearly. They have a two-week shelf life once they land, and they don't get to the consumer. And now we're talking a greater issue around food security. Products that can't get the rural and remote communities. Have a conversation with Powell's Markets in Newfoundland about the amount of waste they go through because of inefficient supply chains. So we have to break down a few key components here. What are we doing relative to domestically some of our key programs that can move product to rural and remote communities as a key function. The elements talking around roads, infrastructure, I won't get into it. We've heard clarity around the importance of them. But I want to reiterate, without all these pieces being connected, the system does not function. The orchestra cannot play. And then we have to look at the global connectivity. 
We, we look inside the country and we say, are our supply chains functioning well? The bigger issue is, how are our supply chains effectively functioning with our global partners? And we heard a little bit of that in the conversation, and that's the biggest piece. You know, when we see issues in the Suez Canal, when we see challenges on a, in geopolitical issues around the world, this is truly where we have to understand how we function as a business relative to where our inputs are, and moving forward, what business decisions do we have to make in Canada relative to how our supply chains are working, whether it's nearshoring, whether it's trying to determine how we diversify our markets, how are we actually looking at our partnership relationships, and how are we driving change through the system, not going into the detail that was already noted, but how do we ensure all those business relationships will be solidified moving forward? The complexity is actually quite simple, but it comes back to alignment of our regulatory framework and also through the fragmentation domestically and internationally. I'll give you one good example. I got an email yesterday from a, a member. Their product's being held at the border because of a ministerial exemption. I won't get into the detail if you don't know what an ME is, but the reality is it was on bulk lettuce. Well, we don't have any more ministerial exemptions on bulk lettuce, but it's still in airs. And Border Services held the product, and we had to go through the process of getting it released. How does that happen? So these are the things, this is real life, real time issues that we have to work through to try and understand how do we make sure we modernize our system, we talk about sustainability, what's scalable? The big question comes back to creating a sustainability strategy without a scalable model, looking at the diversity of jurisdictions where we have the uh, port authorities, then we go down to the terminal operators, privatized frameworks versus public frameworks, investments in those to ensure that they are focusing on the same timeline. So at the end of the day, the growers in this room aren't holding a bag saying you have to achieve this, but the supply chain isn't actually moving in the direction that they're being told to move. And I'll stop there because I know we have some questions. Thank you, Ron. Thank you all for your comments. Um, Arun, it's, it's interesting. The theme here seems to be investment. Investment in infrastructure, the physical infrastructure of our roadways and our railways and our ports, the investments in sustainability, the investments in digital. But your comment resonated with me, money's scarce. What's the model? Because I, I don't think there needs to be an expectation that government puts the bill. But what is that public-private model to ensure that we can expedite these investments and start to actually have significant impact on the supply chains. So, uh, I'm very heartened to, you to say, well, this is, I'm very heartened that uh, you said that uh, government doesn't have to fund everything. I'm gonna write that down. <laughs> I'm not gonna do that. Um, but I think it's a little bit of what Mark said, uh, what Ron said, and what Jean said. Right? So, if you want to, if you're faced with an investment decision, what do you want? You want predictability. And you want, predictability around the regulatory framework. You want predictability uh, around performance. You want to make sure that it's the right investment. And there are certain investments where you want government uh, funding. Right? And so, you know, when you were talking about the regulatory framework, I think that is key to the work of the supply chain office, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Treasury Board uh, in, I think it was budget 2022, came out and said, you know, we really do have to look at our regulatory frameworks because often, you know, one, you know, things don't get updated in systems, but often you have, you know, regulations that function across purposes. And so one is how do you have a regulatory environment to ensure fluidity, I think, um, is the, the first one. The second is, you know, where, where do those investments make the greatest benefit? And I think this is where the digital piece comes in and the visibility piece that Jean spoke to, is to ensure that we know when there are scarce resources that the investments will produce the greatest benefit. Return to, our, to, to the private sector colleagues, but to the system, if there is government funding. Um, and, and yes, there is a role for government funding uh, there as well. Right? And that's why you have programs such as the National Trade Corridors Program that will come in on infrastructure investments. I think, you know, one of the things, Ron, you know, when you were talking about the North and food security in the North, I think often when we think of supply chains, 
you know, we think of the traditional ones on road uh, going north south or on rail going east to west, and we forget about the north. And this is where, you know, the reality is air. And you know, what is the infrastructure around cargo and air? And so last year, the government invested uh, with one of the carriers to provide cargo space and refrigerated cargo space to ensure uh, that goods do move. And it is a food security issue, right? And so I think. You know, if you want private investment, and that, that investment and that investment in that cargo facility unlock private investment. So I think all of those pieces have to work together uh, in an environment where, where public and private resources are scarce. You know, can I just respond to that? Because I think that's key, and I think the pieces is all the, what are the elements? So it's to implement an air strategy without having the logistics on the base to actually handle it, right? Do I have the... Yeah. Uh, storage capacity, and we dealt with this during the pandemic. We distributed $11 million worth of food around Canada as one of the uh, four organizations working with uh, the uh, food rescue program. One of the biggest things we found through bringing our logistical expertise was it's one thing to get it there. Then what are we doing on the investment strategies in the north and in other communities around just receiving, distributing, and uh, managing it. And this is where the complexity of our supply chains domestically even break down further, which take municipal engagement, provincial engagement, territorial engagement, uh, council engagement with uh, various communities around the country. And it's, I think the supply chain office is really starting that path, which is exciting. Mark, our rail networks very vital for long distance transportation. Um, but we are facing challenges such as limited capacity, outdated infrastructure, congestion, and dur especially during particular peak seasons. From an investment perspective, where do you see the priorities for your industry in regards to trying to relieve some of these issues that exist within the rail system? Um, both class ones uh, have capital intensive strategic plans and uh, they make targeted investments in the parts of the country where there are perhaps uh, you know some bottlenecks or there's a need for additional investments, but you know I'll come back to what Ron said. Like this needs to be coordinated, you know. And, and by the way, the, the orchestra starts at the farm gates, okay? <laughs> yeah. And because from there you you get you know the, the the full integration of the supply chain. And yes, we need all supply chain. Uh, all parts of the supply chain to make smart investments. Um, you know, one point that Jam made, which you know, you know, the, the example of the strike of the, the strike of the port of Montreal. You know, Canada is a global is a trading nation, and our reputation is dependent on our ability to be seen as reliable trading partners. And labor instability is a growing concern in our country. And uh, certainly from a railway perspective, we're, 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 we're seeing the challenges of that uh, with collective agreements for both class ones uh, uh, up uh, this, uh, well, currently up and in negotiation. Uh, you know, we believe in collective bargaining, but we also believe that the government needs to have certain tools in its arsenal to ensure that supply chains, especially for, you know, goods, uh, that are considered essential, yeah. uh, that we, we have some labor stability. And, and I, I think it's not only investments, we need labor stability as well as we go for it. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. John, you travel from coast to coast to coast as the co-chair. Um, how would you grade Canada's agricultural s supply chain from a functionality perspective at this particular point? I think we are key issue. We're in a, still not efficient. There's a lot, still a lot of bottleneck in terms of distribution, transportation, uh, capacity, uh, and infrastructure. You know, just look what we went through, and I bring that back to what we went on inflation and food prices, okay? Everybody were looking at retailer blaming on one side the, the retailers, but the cost of goods were going up. And unfortunately, it seemed that even though there was increases, the farmers were also under tremendous pressure, not even giving, covering all their costs. So it means that the system, there's too many bottlenecks that are adding costs in the system, and that's why we need to have, eventually, to, you know, to get it to that digitized 
and have to end to end supply chain information so that was, we reduce those costs because we have been trying to push the price up to consumer, but unfortunately, there's other costs in the system bottlenecked or adding costs in which now the farmers, the producers, the farmers and, and livestock are not covering all their costs because of those bottlenecks. So I think right now, it sh show, even though we were pointing at retailers, but I think we were, the farmers are not, if we're pointing at retailers, there's on the other side, farmers are getting and they're, they're pricing up, but they're not covering all their costs. They're under margin pressure. It's so therefore, there's too much any cost in the system that we need to reduce. Cost is an issue, affordability is an issue, and it does certainly translate back to the consumer, and we're all experiencing yeah. the dissatisfaction that most consumers are experiencing now. Ron, you talked a little bit about regulation. Um, within your industry, where do you see the need for change within regulations, either at the federal level or provincial, or you know, potentially even municipal? Yeah, so simple things is, you know, utilization of programs like FAST. You know, when you are a heavily regulated industry and uh, you have uh, jurisdictional requirements to go through CBSA and then CFIA, FAST doesn't work. It's slow. And these models, how do you streamline and how do you align the uh, various uh, agencies and departments so that the system can uh, effectively move through? And in many cases, when you're looking at, uh, well, even going broader than that, one step further on municipal uh, regulations, we go back to ports. We go back to uh, how do we uh, actually put in play the right system to enable trucks to get out of the port, port more effectively, right? There, the, it goes back to, you have a municipal uh, rule on, uh, well, we go back to uh, truck weights, okay? Spring weights. Driving through Quebec for, is a very frustrating thing, dealing with some of the spring weights compared to other provinces. The, the uh, misalignment of some of these rules do not help commerce and commercial delivery of goods uh, when you have to lightweight your trucks to get product through the system. So there's a range, you know, we could be here for probably the good hour talking through them, but I think the biggest piece comes back to how are we operating within the FedProp territorial function? How are we bringing in the Federation, Canadian Federation of Municipalities into the mix? But then on top of that, to a run's point, how do we bring multi-department focus to this? And the supply chain office has their hands full because at the end, the ownership of all of this does not sit within transport alone. Yeah, I think that is one of the huge values of the supply chain office is that you get that whole of government approach to things versus a very fragmented approach, which hasn't been particularly successful to this particular point. Harun, ports um, have become more and more congested, and every passing year, significant labor issues remain top on the agenda, while industry is feeling the crippling impact of costs and delays. What specific investments or regulatory models should be considered making sure our ports are well suited for the future? So, I mean, I think we're all seized, and every time you know, there's a media report about, you know, port performance. You know, we, uh, you know, we kind of sigh very deeply, right? And, and ports are, you know, incredibly important assets given, you know, our trade patterns. And, and so there has been a number of uh, investments uh, through the National Trade Corridors Fund and otherwise funded by the Canada Infrastructure Bank at, at augmenting, you know, uh, port capacity. So I'll go back to what Jean said uh, about digital and infrastructure, because there's a link. Right? It's, you know, I mean, if I go back to an economics concept, is how, do you, how are you maximizing the utility of your physical infrastructure? I think the assumption is that ports are congested and are at or beyond capacity. And that's not something that I'm necessarily sold on. I think that through the right investments and the right types of um, analysis and, and, and brought to life through visualization of data, we will find that port, there's an efficiency gain that you can get just through better sharing of information. So before we go through an investment decision at a port, funding by government, environmental assessments, and all of the other issues, I think the focus really needs to be is, are we maximizing 
um, the efficiency of our ports. And I, I would argue, from what I've seen, is there's room for ports uh, to improve their operational performance. I think, you know, Mark talked about a couple of things. One, you know, um, loading grain in the rain, and that's uh, an issue that, you know, I mean, the first time I heard it, I said, really? And then, you know, with every, you know, meeting I have, and I hit my head on the desk ever so slightly, so because it is complicated. But I think tackling some of those things to maximize um, throughput uh, becomes really important. Right? I think the other thing that really strikes me is when you talk to, to port authorities and, um, and you know, railway companies and terminal operators, they, everybody has the, the right goodwill to make the system work. I think it's how do you, as you said, conduct the orchestra properly um, for that to happen. That's not to uh, go back to the first point. You know, investment is needed. If we look at Vancouver, we know where the infrastructure choke points are. It is not a secret. The reality is, you know, what is the right funding mix to do that? How do we make sure that works? How do we, we respect the competitive dynamics that exist in the marketplace? Um, and there is a role in, in, for the for pension funds. In last year's budget, there was a line that said pension funds are encouraged to invest in Canadian infrastructure. And I think there's more to come there, um, but I think you know, Canada has what it needs. I think it's just how do we deploy that very effectively and with a sense of urgency. Hey, Mark, where do, where do you see, from a railroad perspective, the opportunities of efficiencies in your relationship with the ports? Yeah, again, you know, I, I think Arun nailed it, right? Um, you know, we, we need to be better at, you know, That's imagine. the first time Mark's ever said that. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you got to cheer for another hockey team. For <laughs> uh, port capacity, efficiency, throughput. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, port dwell times have increased. Uh, global marine vessel on time performance has decreased. Uh, you know, our global port rankings are not good. So, you know, I, I think, you know, whether it be, you know, pension funds, invest, target investment by pension funds in our ports, whether it be, accelerated depreciations for the, the, the terminals and, and the other supply chain partners that are making those investments. Anything we can do uh, to, to drive more investments through our ports is critical uh, because there's some choke points, especially at the Port of Vancouver. But again, there's some low-line fruits. Uh, they low grain in the rain in Seattle and Portland. They do it safely. They've been doing it for some time. Boy, we, you know, that's, that's a model we got to duplicate in Canada. Yeah. Can, can, can I add up, uh, uh, Michael? The Americans are investing heavily in their port. Okay, they need they 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 know what to talk about business business. We have to also keep that in mind because those eight maritime company worldwide will drop their container where it's the best reliable sub partner to do business with. So. If we are not ready to, we're not investing, make sure that our ports are efficient, they'll drop their container in the United States and say, hey, guys, pick up your container out south. That's it. Those eight guys control 80% of the world tonnage. We cannot look at ourselves and just say, hey, we think we're okay for Canada. We are a world trader. We're competing. And those companies are controlling the tonnage on the ocean. What's even more interesting is on that, on the regulatory side, when we look at how the U.S. is regulating data and the requirement to report in a timely manner so that you can make business decisions so port authorities and terminal operators can't sit on the data and say we're dealing in a competitive environment. We have to be able to access the data quickly and move it through. And back to the point earlier on people making decisions to go through the U.S., happening regularly. You know, ha so, so I think this is something, you're, just to, to pick up on the data point. So. Bill C-33 actually enables uh, ports uh, to compel users to share data, right? And again, that speaks to the low-hanging fruit of if we, I believe the system, everybody makes good decisions, but in their own interest, right? Without a full picture of, you know, how do you get a port to function, right? And increasing the capacity and efficiency of a port makes everybody better. It makes railway companies more money, it makes terminals more money. Producers get their stuff through. It makes us a more reliable export partner, right? And so even legislatively, right, the other piece that's in Bill C-33, you talked about vessel dwell times. Well, we're looking at active vessel management. So we're managing, you know, as part of an expanding, for example, in Vancouver, the jurisdiction over anchorages for the port so that they can 
get vessels in and out quicker so that you know, goods aren't waiting. Right? And again, the digital piece, um, you know, it's frightening when you think about you know, the lack of digital maturity that's in the supply chain. The fact that you, know, you would think that you could, like you do at a UPS, you can scan a, a container and you know what's in it. Well, that's not the case. But that takes investment. And I think you know, part of what we're, you know, we're, we're down that path on the digital end is what that looks like. And that may be a little bit down in the future, but I think our priority is how do you build that digital foundation? I, I think we have to look internationally, to be honest. Uh, had a meeting in February with the Port of Antwerp, uh, LA. You know, it's amazing to see what best practice exists in the markets. Yeah. I know Montreal, through the Port Authority network, they're, they're connected. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it'd be really curious to see where the government of Canada and the, and the yeah. uh, office can focus. Yeah, so on. very much like the you know, I mean, some of this Jean would be very familiar with with his work is you know in Antwerp and others like looking at port community systems and how those you know drive efficiencies. And so again, I don't think we're under you know we understand that in order to build the best in class um, supply chain for agriculture and other goods, you know we have to be better than every we have to be a step ahead. And I think that's you know what I mean. We have good partners in this room on this stage uh, to do that. And so you know, I, th I think in a, in a previous meeting, I said I'm a shameless plagiarist. I'm very, very happy to look at examples from, from elsewhere, but you know, I'll add my own flourish to get the A+. Plus. Just think about the Netherlands, Arun, how they, they are a yep. world leader in the food business yep. and how they develop their system with dry port. Yep. They're taking care of goods rapidly. Very much. Yeah. But they see it as an ecosystem too, right? Yeah. It's not just no, it's port not. efficiency. It's, it's as you said, how do you make the drainage sector work? How do you use inland terminals or intermodal facilities? They look at it at a system level, right? And I think, you know, we are where, you know, I can't undo the past, but I think, you know, where there is, I think, in speaking with industry and others and producers and terminal operators, we're at this interesting moment where we're all aligned uh, on, on what the outcomes are. Well, gentlemen, we're out of time, unfortunately. Um, amazing perspectives on this particular subject. I think the things that resonated with me, we, we are, we have an orchestra. And to Ron's point, every piece within the orchestra must be well-tuned and for the supply chain to work. I think we have in front of us significant investments that are required both in the digital aspect, and Arun, I, I, I take your point, um, digital investments will create efficiencies within the system that we need to really work towards. Um, sustainability continues to be a significant issue, and the investments, investments we need to make in that physical infrastructure, whether it be roads and, and railways, and I know, Arun, your minister made some Remarks last week, I believe, in regards to some investments in roadways, which uh, I think to the trucking industry was probably good news because there was some information from another minister a few weeks before that that kind of indicated there was no investment. So uh, I, I think we've got our challenges ahead, but I think what I also yield from today is that the industry, and especially agriculture, are quite keen to work together to find these solutions. Um, we certainly appreciate the support of government and support of the railway industry, and uh, I think it's critically important, and, and hopefully we will continue to work as an orchestra and uh, accomplish what's required in regards to investment and efficiencies within our supply network. So, gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.